so welcome to this session and uh, very small and sweet crowd so i welcome dr rohit saxena uh, as a co-convener of this session and the first talk we will have is management of rare pediatric case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension presenting with seizures dr amit prasad Good evening, one and all. Uh, it's a great honor to be presenting on this great forum. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, management of a rare pediatric case of idiopathic intracranial hypertension presenting with seizures. Uh, my chief author is Dr. Vaira Mansur. He's a professor and chief of pediatric squint neuroophthalmology in Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. Uh, IIH for pseudotumor cerebri is a syndrome characterized by raised intracranial pressure with normal CSF components and no secondary cause detected on imaging. Clinical features are secondary to raised ICP syndrome like nausea, vomiting, headaches, and transient blurring of vision. There might be diplopia due to involvement of the sixth nerve. These are well described in middle-aged obese women. IIH can present in children of any age group. Clinical features in post-pubertal age group are similar to adult population, while in pre-pubertal age group it can be varying. Incidence is about 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 cases per 1 lakh pediatric population. Risk factors include vitamin A overdose, exposure to drugs like tetracycline, minocycline, doxycycline, retinoic acid, and lithium, as well as use or withdrawal of steroids. Methods. A four-year-old girl uh, in a, a known case of febrile status epilepticus was brought to Sarojini Devi Hospital on 2nd, uh, 11, uh, 11th of February by her parents for follow-up one month after the last episode. She had no ocular complaints as such. She has a recent admission of admi uh, in Nilofar Hospital for in view of seizure attack. Birth history was not significant. Family history, developmental history, and immunization history are not significant. On examination, the child is conscious, alert, and active, and her vitals are within normal limits. Anterior segment had no abnormalities, except uh, extraocular movements were uh, full and free, both versions and actions. PDR and retinoscopy were as follows. Fundus examination is normal, except for blur blurring of nasal disc margin. B scan showed both eyes echo-free VC and disc edema more in the left eye compared to the right eye. NCT was normal and OCT was normal. EEG report showed an abnormal sleep record stage in stage 2 and 3 which was suggestive of generalized seizure disorder. CSF analysis was normal but the opening pressures were more than 370 mm of H2O. MRI showed CSF intensity fluid noted around the optic nerves suggestive of bilateral papilledema. Blood investigation showed EBV IgM antibodies positive. So she was started on the following medications, namely metazolamide, calcimox, levipil, and multivitamin tablets. Pediatric IIH has a very low incidence as such. It is essential to investigate for possible precipitating factors that might lead to raised ICP, especially space-occupying lesions or any other intracranial pathology. Clinically, it is commonly seen as a bulging of anterior fontanelle in earlier ne neonatal life. As seen in this particular case scenario, the etiology could have been a viral infection causing an imbalance between production and drainage of CSF, leading to a raised ICP. The child was followed up one month, after, one month later, and it is noted that the papilledema is dissolving and there is significant symptomatic relief with the current treatment regimen. The presentation of IIH in pediatric populations has several important distinctions from that in adults, especially among prepubertal patients, in which there is no apparent association with gender or obesity. Pediatric patients are more likely to be asymptomatic or present with atypical symptoms than their adult counterparts. Ideal treatment practices and the natural history of pediatric IH remain unclear. Estazolamide is the mainstay of medical treatment, but some patients with significant visual loss may require surgical intervention. These are my references, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for a very uh, important issue to be raised. It's very important for us to look at pediatric IH because uh, these, unfortunately, kids get missed and uh, they lose significant vision before we are able to do any form of intervention. So um, in your, exp I mean, like with this patient or any other patients that you have seen, what would be the other presentations that a child may have for uh, pediatric IH? Sir, no, normally the visual symptoms as such are less, but the child might present with uh, raised ICP, symptoms of ra uh, raised ICP, like nausea, vomiting, or 
if there is a six nerve involvement, which is at the late stages, it can be with the diplopia. Great. So exactly, these things unfortunately get missed, and the patient gets referred for all other kind of yes, issues, including headache, and if the child is older, headache. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit. I think thank we'll you, take the next presentation and then we'll have any discussion. Any other person, uh, any other speaker who has come for the session? Anyway, we'll go on to Dr. Sandhya, uh, who will be speaking on an interesting case of uh, blind in, uh, bifid insertion of the inferior oblique in case of superior oblique palsy. So, Dr. Sandhya. Oh, very good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I, li I would like to thank A AIOS for giving me this opportunity. Um, uh, today, my topic of presentation is an interesting case of bifid insertion of inferior oblique muscle in a case of superior oblique palsy. Uh, uh, congenital anomalies of insertion of recti muscles are known feature. A bifid head uh, has been found in SR and IR. Uh, congenital anomalies of inferior oblique has been found and reported in cadaveric subjects, but bifid head of inferior oblique has been uh, has not been reported till now. Um, our case is she is a nine-year-old girl presented in our OPD with squint and anomalous head posture for six months. There was no history of trauma. Visual acuity is uh, six by six and six by twelve. BCVA, uh, her right eye was plano and left eye with one diopter cylinder at 180 degrees. She was improving to six nine. Her head posture got right head tilt with a right-sided facial hypoplasia. Pupil was NSRL and anterior segment findings were within normal limits. This is the photograph of the girl. On squint evaluation, word for, uh, on word for dot test, left eye suppression was there, uh, stereo acuity was absent. Motor evaluation, she had full fee uh, inductions and versions. Left eye got hypertropia on primary position. Uh, her left hypertropia uh, was increased to 45, uh, 40 prism adapter and decreased to uh, 50 was increased to 40 prism adapter on right gaze and uh, decreasing to 15 prism adapter on left gaze. Uh, this, uh, this left uh, hypertopia was decreased to 15 prism adapter on right head tilt and increased to 45 prism adapter on left head tilt. Her ocular movement showed over elevation in adduction position of grade 4 in the left eye. So a diagnosis of congenital left eye superior oblique palsy with inferior oblique overaction grade 4 was made. This is our uh, this is a photograph showing nine gazes, showing normal ocular motility. Uh, the, during the surgical, so a surgical plan of left eye inferior oblique uh, anterior transposition under GA was made. During the surgery, this is the oblique, uh, inferior oblique we held, and this is the bifid head. This is the bifid head we found. Uh, we disinserted the muscle and we did, we sutured both the uh, heads together. This is the first head and this is the second head. This one is the second head and we inserted both of them together. And we placed it uh, lateral, temporal to the inferior rectus muscle. Post-operatively, she was orthotropic, head tilt was markedly corrected. Uh, so at a conclusion, I would like to say, while doing inferior oblique surgery, we should always look for another head. A lost head can be a cause of undercorrection. These are my references. Thank you. Just inferior oblique, uh, uh, anterior transposition corrected 40. Yes, uh, on post-operative she was. Well, did you uh, do an FTT prior to doing the uh, yes, surgery? Sir. Yes, sir. We did. So, um, what were the findings, like for the SO and for the IO? Uh, sir, uh, while uh, pushing uh, down towards the apex of the uh, apex of the eye, we found inferior oblique to be very lax, sir. And uh, but in, and uh, it was moving uh, in and up very easily. The but inferior oblique or the superior oblique? Superior, superior oblique. oblique. Superior. So yeah, in so it was very lax superior oblique, yes. and uh, what is not uncommonly seen in a superior oblique palsy. So very nice, very interesting to see a bifid head, another head. The only thing was that, uh, uh, as Dr. Love is pointing out, that sometimes 40 prisms getting corrected by one muscle is generally up to 18 to 20 prisms you may expect that one muscle would correct. But uh, maybe that uh, inferior oblique was acting, uh, that bifid head may be preventing that downward movement of the eye. And that may be responsible for the significant vertical that you're getting. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya. Thank you so much.
Any other? So it's uh, Dr. Kar Kirandeep Kaur, no, Dr. Bharat Gurnani, Alisha Ali Khan, come. So she would be presenting a rare case report of Cruzan syndrome. A very good evening to everybody present here. I would like to th thank the AIOS committee for a chance to speak at this platform. The topic for my case presentation is a rare case report on Cruzon syndrome. Cruzon syndrome is an autosomal dominant disorder characterized by craniosynostosis of coronal and sagittal sutures, which begins in the first year of life. It was first described by a French neurosurgeon, Octave Cruzon, in 1912. It is caused by mutation in the fibroblast growth factor receptor 2 gene, FGFR2. Now the case report. A six-year-old male child presented to the ophthalmology OPD with chief complaints of protrusion of both eyes since birth. The mother of the child also reported that the child often complains of headache and constantly rubs his eyes. HOPI, the patient was apparently symptomatic since birth. The mother noticed prominence of both the eyeballs, which was progressive in nature. The prominence was not associated with any pain. There was no postural variation in the prominence. There is no history of skin discoloration or hyperpigmentation of lids or eyes, fever, headache, nausea or vomiting, dysphonia, dysphagia or easy fatigability. There is no history of radiation or chemotherapy, nasal block, frequent RTIs or epistaxis. Past history. The child was born at the hospital. It was a full-term normal vaginal delivery. The baby cried at birth, and all his milestones were achieved at normal time. There is no history of any systemic illness. Personal history, patient consumes a mixed diet, and his bowel and bladder habits are regular. The father of the patient also has similar complaints. <coughs> On general examination, the vitals were normal. There was no paleoictrus clubbing or cyanosis, no lymphadenopathy. All systemic examinations were within normal limits. limits. The positive findings were the mental status of the uh, patient was normal. There was shortening of the AP skull diameter. Frontal bossing was present. Mandibular prognathism, parrot beak nose appearance. And there was a high arch palate in, uh, during intraoral examination. An ENT examination was also conducted, which revealed a mild conductive hearing loss. Ocular examination. Best corrected visual acuity was 6 by 6 partial in both eyes. Bilateral proptosis with hypertailorism was present. Navzinger sign was positive. Extraocular motility was complete in both eyes. Lids were normal. Conjunctiva was normal. The cornea was clear. And the anterior chamber had normal depth. Iris, there was normal color and pattern observed. Pupils were round, reactive, and regular. And the lens was clear. This is the image. The IPD of the patient was 75 millimeters. We can see there is a shortening of the AP skull diameter. The jaw is prominent, and there is hypertellurism. This is the intraoral examination, which reveals a high arch palate. There was a pro proptosis of 35 millimeters. This is the image of the father of the patient, and he had similar features. Investigations that were carried out were the hematological picture was within normal limits, thyroid function test was normal, urine al analysis was normal, and Cassoni's test was negative. And MRI brain with orbit was done. On this, we can see that the patient has bilateral proptosis, the orbits are shallow, and there is hypoplastic maxillary sinus. In this image, we, uh, we can see dilated ventricles, which is indicative of mild hydrocephalus. Over here, we can see uh, there is an irregular shape of the skull. This is due to premature closure of the sutures. On X-ray during water's view, we can see a copper beaten skull. Management, multidisciplinary approach was uh, taken. Early craniectomy, uh, crani sorry, craniotomy is uh, advised to prevent and to treat raised ICP if present. If needed, mid-facial advancement and jaw surgery can be done. Prognosis depends on the severity of malformations. This patient was further referred to neurosurgery department and the plastic surgery department. 
The differential of this case is Appert syndrome, Pfeiffer, Jackson Weiss, Carpenter, and Seth Rich Hodgson. This is probably a case of Cruzon syndrome. Cruzon syndrome has an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern with variable expression. Mutation in the FGFR2 gene, which maps to chromosome 10, Q25, and Q26, are responsible for all cases. The incidence is 1 in 25,000 births throughout the world. It constitutes 4.8% of all craniosynostosis cases. There is no sex predilection. Other features of Cruzon are proptosis caused by shallow orbit with or without divergent strabismus, orbital hypertellurism, papilledema, optic atrophy, exposure keratitis, and visual loss. V-shaped maxillary dental arch can be seen, maxillary hypoplasia, frontal bossing, conductive hearing loss, upper airway obstruction causing respiratory distress, and acanthosis nigricans. Progressive hydrocephalus occurs in less than one-third of the patients. On, uh, concluding the case, initial diagnosis during antenatal period through DNA testing for mutation of FGFR2 gene and prenatal ultrasound may be helpful to indicate forthcoming developmental problems. Hence, providing the option for terminating the pregnancy or optimal postnatal management and counseling for the family. To prevent complications like airway obstruction and decreased vision, early diagnosis and management is important. As intelligence is not affected, patient is able to lead a normal life, as is the case of the father of this patient. These are my sources. Thank you. So it's a, what type of uh, any refractive error did this child have? Uh, yes, ma'am, ma'am, uh, he was uh, hypermetropic. We prescribed him plus uh, 0.50 glasses for both eyes. Plus 0.50, sorry, ma'am. Okay. Hmm. So there was no, means, uh, there was no amblyopia in this case. So like vision was 6-6 six, six in both the eyes, you are saying? Yes, ma'am. So did uh, anything else, like, other no, than proptosis in your case? Uh, so, ma'am, ocular findings, nothing else was there. No, so did, uh, so multidisciplinary are uh, talking about, so did uh, anything uh, you send this patient for any uh, ma further? we did send him for further evaluation to the neurosurgery department because in these cases we can have ra uh, raised ICP, intracranial tension. But ma'am, since papilledema was not seen, yeah. To be on the safe side for uh, uh, for the presence of uh, hydrocephalus, we referred him. Yeah, but other than that, also it's always needed the neurosurgeon opinion because earlier you have to have uh, them whether they can go in for a craniotomy or not okay. because that is always there. You may not have it, but you have to send to okay. a neurosurgeon. Okay. Another important thing in our clinic, uh, we have to be very careful while doing indirect. If you if you retract the eyelids, the eye pops up. And uh, then it becomes, uh, actually I had in one of my case in my OPD, and then you have to just manually push it back. So better not to retract the lids while doing indirect, just do it from distance when the chi child is looking at different directions. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, is Dr. Shreya Soni? Yeah. So she will be speaking on ocular myasthenia gravis in a four-year-old female child. Good evening to one and all present here. I thank AIUS for giving me this platform to speak here. I'm Dr. Shreya Soni, third year junior resident from Katihar Medical College, and I'll be speaking on a uh, case of ocular myasthenia gravis in a four-year-old female child. Uh, introduction, uh, myasthenia gravis is a disease that affects neuromuscular uh, junction, and it results in a, uh, classical symptoms of variable muscle and uh, weakness and fatigability. Uh, ocular myasthenia gravis is a subtype of myasthenia gravis which manifests most commonly as ptosis and diplopia uh, in 90% of the patients. And uh, other manifestations can be nystagmus, anisocoria, impaired accommodation, sluggishly reactive pupils and, uh, pupils and gaze palsy. Uh, so history, a four-year-old female child presented to IOPD with uh, drooping of both lids and uh, it was since three and a half months uh, the child also had difficulty in movement of eyeball. The eye movements were restricted uh, since three and a half months. Uh, there were no history of fatigability, difficulty in chewing, speaking, uh, swallowing, walking. Uh, past history, the perinatal history was normal and uh, the child was breastfed and immunized periodically. Uh, the developmental uh, 
the development was according to age and there was no history of thyroid disorder in the child or the mother and uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, any uh, nervous system disorder. Uh, there was no history of fever, seizure, trauma to head or spine, no history of diplopia, nystagmus or strabismus. Uh, examination, uh, head, orthophoric uh, posture was present and uh, face, there was a lack of, uh, there was lack of expressions. Upper and lower limb, no prominent wasting was seen. Uh, normal tone was there and reflexes were normal. Uh, systemic examination, uh, respiratory system, cardiovascular system, uh, per abdomen and uh, uh, central nervous examination were normal and uh, no paleoectrosinosis, clubbing and lymphadenopathy uh, were present. On ocular examination, the uh, uncorrected and best corrected uh, visual equity were uh, for right eye, uh, 4 by 60 and uh, best corrected uh, was 6 by 36. Uh, uncorrected was 4 by 16 left eye and uh, best corrected was 6 by 36. Eyelid, uh, right eye ptosis was, moderate ptosis was present and same in the left eye. Uh, palpebral fissure height was 5 mm in both the eyes. Uh, MRD1 was 1 mm, MRD2 was 5 mm and LPS function was 2 to 3 mm which was poor. Upper lid crease was present, uh, Bell's phenomenon was positive, Marcus Gunn jaw winking uh, was negative. Ice pack test was po uh, positive and extraocular movements uh, were moderately restricted in all the directions, minus two to minus three. And uh, fatigability, it worsened on the up gaze in both the eyes. Kogan twitch sign was positive and bean fang sign was positive in both the eyes. And uh, lid lag was absent. Uh, this is the image of the patient during the first visit. Uh, so this. Uh, first picture is uh, before ice pack test. The second picture is after we applied the ice pack for two to three minutes in the left eye. Uh, so in uh, the ptosis uh, reduced. Uh, investigations that we did were acetylcholine receptor antibody test, which came positive, uh, which was 17.91 nanomole per liter. Uh, TSH, T3, T4 were normal. CCT thorax was done to rule out thymoma uh, thymic tumors can be present in uh, such cases, so that uh, came out to be normal study. CBC, ANA, ESR, RBS, and uh, peripheral blood smear were done, which were within normal limit uh, to rule out uh, SLE and uh, diabetes and uh, pernicious anemia. Uh, the treatment uh, that we gave was uh, corticosteroid, uh, syrup prednisolone sodium phosphate was given uh, for 1.5 mg per kg per day. And uh, it is given for uh, 12 weeks, and then after that we had pl we planned to be tapered. This was done in accordance to a pediatric uh, neurologist in uh, from the college, and uh, uh, with it multivitamins were given. Calcium and vitamin D3 was given. Post treatment, uh, the patient uh, reviewed on 4th of January 2023. Uh, that was after eight weeks of corticosteroid therapy, after which the best corrected visual acuity was six by nine. Uh, no ptosis was present, extraocular movements were within normal limit. Kogan twitch sign was negative, bean fang sign was also negative, and ocular fatigability had reduced. So discussion, myasthenia gravis is a potentially serious but treatable autoimmune disease affecting neuromuscular junction of uh, skeletal muscle, and ocular myasthenia Gravis can mimic isolated cranial nerve palsies, uh, gaze palsies, and internuclear ophthalmoplegia, blepharospasm, and a stroke. Uh, the differential diagnosis were congenital myasthenic syndrome, thyroid ophthalmopathy, Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome, uh, chronic uh, progressive external ophthalmoplegia, even though it's present in third or fourth decade, but early onset, and uh, muscular dystrophy, pupil sparing, third nerve palsy, and brainstem tra trauma. Uh, these are my sources. Thank you, and uh, very good case. Just one correction, because you are just starting. Restricted movement, you cannot say, yeah, unless you have done uh, post-duction test. So better term would be limitation of movement. And, and uh, s second is, uh, how did you suspect uh, myopia in this, uh, my myasthenia gravis in this case? And what, what was the point on which you had a suspicion of myasthenia gravis? Ice pack test was positive, which but why did you do ice pack test? So ptosis was present, uh, external uh, extraocular movements were uh, restricted, so like limitation, and uh, so this 
uh, history there was no other uh, thing like uh, they also did uh, we also had uh, told for ct brain and everything <laughs> but uh, there was nothing else that is what when there is nothing else that is when you should start uh, suspecting myasthenia and second thing it is not fitting into one pro diagnosis if it is not fitting into any one did the in the history did the mother give you any history some history you should be asking particularly did the mother give any history about the child mom for tgibility yeah i'm asking did you ask that uh, yes, question ma anything ma'am this was their first visit regarding this this was the first symptom they came normally it doesn't happen but in 15% cases in some studies they have told that they present with ocular myasthenia vivid no that is the thing no what are your other uh, differentials in this cases you are saying you cannot just go on saying this is initially as a myasthenia so initially what all things we should think and then think of of having a myasthenia we what are the things we rule out before we go for myasthenia so congenital ptosis can be there but okay. then uh, lichies was uh, present so we ruled out that and um, um, congenital congenital ptosis uh, bilateral that bilateral also it could be there but uh, that we ruled out and any any other thing um mam this um a uh, congenital myasthenic syndrome could be there but then again i pack test uh, it will not uh, i mean that is specific for myasthenia vivis so we already ruled that out okay okay thank you thank you will steroids uh, be a long term solution no sir we shouldn't actually use steroids sir we should uh, uh, pyro pyruvate treatment is another e option no that is why i'm asking why did the neurologist usually they don't they give uh, steroids but uh, why didn't they prescribe pyruvate treatment that is what just do you know it uh, yeah no they should have given why not uh, sometimes uh, pyruvate treatment can also cause fatigability and weakness and uh, other uh, side effects also are there of that so so the so initially they have just given and they are observing you are just following up the patient okay Dr. Pail Mukherjee, there. Yeah. So, strasma and reverse strasma syndrome, two similar cases with different uh, management. Good evening, respected panelists and learned people in the hall. I first of all I thank AIOC for giving me this opportunity to present this case. The topic of my case presentation is trauma and reverse trauma syndrome, two similar cases with a different management. So, myelinated nerve fibers in retina. It was first described by Virchow in 19 in 1856. These are isolated findings incidentally detected on detailed examination of retina. they are yellowish white network like thin membrane and they obscure the view of the underlying retinal structures they are sometimes associated with refractive errors maybe myopia or hypermetropia or associated astigmatism amblyopia or strabismus these are some of the studies of myelinated nerve fibers available in literature so bradley r strasma et al first described strasma syndrome in 1979 in a case series of four patients so what is strasma syndrome It is a rare condition which is a triad of amblyopia, myopia, and myelinated nerve fibers in retina. May be unilateral or bilateral. Sometimes associated with strabismus. Now, reverse strasma syndrome. It is even rarer, and it is a triad of hypermetropia instead of myopia and amblyopia and myelinated nerve fibers in retina. So this is our first case. A seven-year-old male child visited our OPD with complaints of diminution of vision and deviated right eye since childhood. Detailed ophthalmological examination in right eye showed a BCVA of 6 by 18 with a glass prescription of minus 6 diopter spherical. Ocular movement were full free and painless, and eyeball in primary position was exotropic. The left eye had a BCVA of 6 by 6 and orthotropia in primary position. Pupil and anterior segment were within normal limit. Fundus of right eye showed a normal disc with a cup disc ratio of 0.3. myelinated nerve fibers superior temporal and inferior temporal to the disc and macula was okay in left eye there were no myelinated fibers so the management plan since 
he had a huge power in right eye and the left eye was it did not have power so we preferred to give him contact lens for right eye and the better eye that is the left eye we advised him occlusion for 3 hours daily we followed up the patient after 60 days the bcva has improved slightly to 6 by 12 partial and so he was advised to continue occlusion therapy in left eye now this is our second case a 22 year old male patient from lower middle class presented with unilateral diminution of vision of left eye which was present since childhood but he ignored now detailed ophthalmological examination in right eye showed a bcva of 6 by 6 with a glass prescription of plus 1.5 diopter spherical eyeball in primary position was orthotropia left eye the bcva was 6 by 60 with a huge glass prescription of plus 8 diopter spherical and plus 3.5 cylinder at 90 the eyeball was orthotropic pupils and anterior segment was within normal limit axial lens calculated was 20.89 millimeter in left eye fundus of left eye showed a normal disc with a cup disc ratio of 0.4 and myelinated nerve fibers superior inferior and temporal to the disc macula was okay so in this case since the patient was 22 years old so the right eye was given full refractive correction of plus 1.5 diopter spherical or he was given the option of contact lens. But in left eye, we could not correct due to diplopia, so plain glasses were given and the visual prognosis was explained. So this is a differential summary of case 1 versus case 2. Our case 1 was a case of strasma syndrome. Here the age of the patient was less than 10 years, so occlusion therapy was advised for amblyopia management. But the second case, the age of the patient was 22 years, it was a reverse strasma syndrome and here since it was 22 years, the occlusion therapy has no role in improving visual acu acuity. So, nerve fibers entering the retina lose their myelin sheath at lamina cribrosa at 8 months of gestation, thus retinal nerve fibers are normally unmyelinated. Myelinated nerve fibers occur when there is faulty location of oligodendrocyte like cells in retina and there is temporal loss or absence of barrier function at the optic nerve head. Three types of myelination are known in the literature. Type 1 pattern along the superior temporal arcade, type 2 pattern along both the arcades and type 3 pattern with no contiguity with the optic nerve head. Our first case, the 7 year old child had a type 1 pattern myelination and the second case, 22 years male with reverse plasma had type 2 pattern myelination. In our case, an isometropic amblyopia seems to have a stronger influence on relative visual acuity of patient's eye than the presence of retinal nerve fiber myelination. This is supported in literature by Ki and Huang, where prognostic factors for the visual improvement in amblyopia are amount of isometropia and the area of myelination. And isometropia plays a more role than the area of myelination. So to conclude, visual prognosis of anisometropic amblyopia associated with myelination of retinal nerve fibers is poorer than anisometropic amblyopia without myelination. It is refractory to occlusion therapy most of the time, but despite having a poor visual prognosis, visual rehabilitation should always be attempted. Thank you. Just one uh, question. What did you do for the second case then? It's like uh, there was a myelination hmm. and it did not improve plus 8. So what actually other thing and, and just finding out that there is a myelination. Uh, actually ma'am that, that patient, that patient he went for an army or some examination and there he came to know first time that he can't see with his left eye. So he presented to us and he gave a history like it was present since childhood but I did not notice now because my medical is not getting cleared for the job so he came. And because it was a huge power and we tried correcting it up to some level, but there was diplopia. We could not correct even... Uh, amblopia. It's amblopia, you know. So why diplopia will be there? No, ma'am. Like we tried correcting, like we tried to give balanced glasses, but still uh, he was not able to tolerate. That is different. That is, no, that is different. Okay. Uh, so it's that you have to... Uh, so yeah. then we had to explain the visual prognosis. And practically what I have noticed, this type 2, what you have mm -hmm. shown, they are generally very refractive to amblyopia therapy. Mm -hmm. even, even if they present at a younger age, mm -hmm. generally they don't respond very well to patching. Mm. Yeah. That, uh, mm. With myelination has a poor yeah. prognosis. That is there in literature also. So with this, we come to the end of the session. Thank you so much. Thank mm. you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, all speakers can join for a group photo, please. Mm.